Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Great to be in the house of the Lord this evening, isn't it? Amen. Amen. And, and great to be saved. Amen. Amen. Uh, I've not spoke with Dean personally. Mama can't hear you. Uh, <laughs> Mama can't hear you. Oh. How about now? Is that any better? She's all right. Yeah. I did speak with uh, with brother brother Jake uh, briefly this afternoon, and uh, you correct me if I say anything wrong, or feel free to add anything uh, that, that maybe you know about. But. Uh, Jennifer had posted early this morning on Facebook, one of prayers, and Jake had, had posted a comment, something about robo-preacher. Uh, and after Dean got through the surgery and I guess woke up some, Jennifer showed him what Jake had posted there. And, uh, he responded, responded to Jake's post, and, and how was it that it went? Uh, he told me I basically needed to beware of peg leg and, uh, <laughs> and called me college boy, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so I know he was all right. He called me college yeah. boy. <laughs> you know, Jake said to me, he said something about him being in his right mind. I, I probably needed to call Dean and, and talk to him because I don't know that I've ever talked to Dean with him in his right mind before. But uh, see how that went. Of course, he had talked about, you know, maybe them doing a head transplant while he was down there. So maybe they got that done too. But uh, I'll... I may, when I get home, call down there and may wait till in the morning. It, it's, it's one of those things, you know, you, you wonder about calling. Is it, is it a good time? And he's, you know, they've been up and uh, no doubt, you know, one of the things Dean had said to me about Jennifer being down there, so she's probably exhausted, no doubt, has been for a while. Yeah. And, uh, she put it on Facebook about 2 o'clock came through surgery, came out of recovery, and he had ate lunch, and they were going to get him up after a while. Well, you know, that he, he had told me, I, I guess a number of weeks ago, that they was going to have him walk him the same day they did the, so, uh, and I, I would, I was going to wait the next Wednesday to bring this up. It, it was something that I did bring up with Dean, and I'll, I'll go ahead and bring it up, and y'all can think about it decide what you want to do. As far as next Wednesday, of course, that'll be the first Wednesday of the month, and that's our our conference. And I, I asked him about that yesterday, and at first he was like, you know, you, you know how I do it, or something like that, just go ahead. And, and then he said, ask the church. Let them decide. So, you know, you got a week now, you can decide by the time next Wednesday comes around if you want to, if you want conference next Wednesday, or if you want to wait to the following month to do it then. Uh, but, you know, with that said, I wouldn't be surprised either way. I really wouldn't be surprised if Dean wasn't here next Wednesday, and I wouldn't be surprised either. And this message has one place that really connects with last week, and it's still in, we will be moving around a little bit, but, uh, if you would, if you'd turn to Romans chapter 13, that's where we're going to start this evening. I'm going to, I'll read Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. You know, last week, as we spoke, at one point, I talked about how it was good to be crucified. That was the message last week. And, and we've seen in Romans chapter 6 about the old man being crucified. And that's, that's this flesh. And at some point we said to think this flesh is dead. Now we still have trouble with this flesh. We have trouble with it every day. There's not a day goes by we don't. There's a battle between the Holy Ghost, the, the Spirit, and this flesh. And it's continual. It's ongoing. It happens every day. And we face it. And 
how this message ties in with last week's when we said that this flesh is dead. Well, what do we put on then? And, and that's what this message is going to deal with this evening is what we put on. What? No, now that this, you know, there was a, 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 a reversal that took place at that time. At the moment you, before you accepted God's gift of salvation, the flesh was alive, but the spirit was dead. The moment you accepted God's gift of salvation, this, God quickened the spirit. He made the spirit alive. And the flesh died. The flesh was crucified with Jesus. And it died. And so what... You don't want the world... You know, you don't want to be walking around with the old dead flesh showing. So what needs to be put on? And that's what tonight's message is about. And so with that, I'm going to read uh, verses from chapter 13 of Romans verses 11 through 14. And for those of us who can and will, let us stand for the reading of God's Word. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Amen to that. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You may be seated. There's two verses I want us to look at immediately here, and that's verses 12 and verse or verse 12 and verse 14. And there's there's two statements here, one in each verse, that I want it to catch our attention. Verse 12. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. At the moment of salvation, that's what we should be doing continually is casting off the works of darkness. Whatever it was, the way we lived, the way we talked, the way we, we walked, the way we carried ourselves, that all died with the flesh and should be cast off. Then in verse 14. Well, before I get to verse 14, there's one more statement in verse 12 I want us to look at, and it's, it's really not part of the message tonight, but I wanted to speak on it briefly. And let us put on the armor of light. Well, what's the armor of light? You know, God at the moment of salvation gives each and every one of us spiritual gifts. Some of them are individualized. For instance, William may have a gift that I don't have. Uh, may has gifts or a gift or gifts that I don't have. Uh, but some gifts are universal. Every child of God gets. Uh, some of them that are individualized think of uh, prophecy. And I don't mean in the Old Testament sense of prophecy where God spoke to a man and gave a particular man ideas of things to come or warnings to give to others. We're not in that position. We've got... Now, has God laid out in His Word everything that He's ever going to do? And the answer is no to that question. But has God laid out everything that we need to know? And the answer to that is yes. So there's no more revelation that God needs to give us here and now. We've got it all in His Word that we need. Well, some of these individualized gifts, think of like I said, prophecy, and that just simply means in the New Testament sense, even though there were some still, or still some New Testament prophets that were like the Old Testament prophets, like John the Baptist, uh, and, and there were some others. But generally speaking, in the New Testament, that gift of prophecy is interpreting the Word of God. Uh, some people have that gift. Some people have the gift of, of teaching. 
brother, brother Jake has that gift. Anybody that's ever, ever sat through a Sunday school lesson with brother, brother Jake knows he's got the gift of teaching. Amen. Uh, you take uh, a couple weeks or week before last. Anybody that can combine or bring up Mama Vernon's mashed potatoes in a lesson, that's a gift from God. I would also say it probably takes somebody that's a little crazy, but, <laughs> but still, it, it absolutely is a gift from God, that gift of teaching. <coughs> But there, the universal gifts that I'm going to speak about tonight, even the ones that's not really part of the message, which I want to start with tonight, they, this armor of light, if you was, and you don't need to turn there, I'm not going to turn there either, but in Ephesians chapter 6, the Holy Ghost through Paul, God the Holy Ghost through Paul tells us about to put on the whole armor of God. And he goes through a list of things that, you know, you've got things like uh, to have all, to, to gird your loins about with truth. Well, in the King James, that word gird or girdle, when you see it, just means belt. So you think belt of truth, uh, loins around your waist. Uh, you've got the shield of faith. You've got the helmet of salvation. You've got the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and, and, and there's a couple of others that are mentioned. And, and they're not really part of tonight's message, but they are things to think about, gifts that God gives all of His believers, and we're told to put them on. And I want you to keep that in mind, put on, because when, we, when I read to you again here, verse 14, and as we go through tonight's message, that's what it's about. But put ye on the Lord Jesus. Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So, point one. How does putting on the Lord Jesus look in sound? And for that, if you would, if you turn to Acts chapter 4. I'm going to give you a little background from Acts chapter 3, but I want you to turn to Acts chapter 3. Or I mean to chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are going to the temple. And as they approach the temple, there's a man that's lame. And he's looking for alms. He's looking for, he's looking for money. He's wanting help. And Peter basically says to him, you know, I've not got any gold or silver. But what I do have, and he spoke in the name of Jesus, and he healed the man. God through Peter healed this man. And then Peter preached a message. And if you go back briefly before this to the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost through Peter preaches a message and 3,000 people are saved. Well, in this message, 5,000 people are saved. But there's some people that's not happy. There are some people that are very unhappy about this, some of the religious leaders. And that's where we get started in chapter 4. And I'm actually going to read the first 13 verses of this chapter. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. And I want to speak briefly about the Sadducees, uh, give you just a little insight into the Sadducees. There were numerous religious groups throughout Israel. Now, the two most common we usually read about is the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, there was, there was numerous differences between those two groups. The Pharisees, we would, if we was to look at what the Pharisees believed in and what the Sadducees believed in, we would find ourselves in far more agreement with the Pharisees than we would the Sadducees. For instance, the Pharisees believed in a bodily resurrection. The Pharisees believed in angels and spirits. Of course, they did have a weakness. They tended to be self-righteous. They tended to put as much weight or more weight into man's thinking as, as opposed to the Word of God. The Sadducees, on the other hand, they didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in angels, and they didn't believe in spirits. And 
so we see here with this group of people that was upset with Peter and John, the Sadducees was part of this group. Verse 2, be grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You see where that would have upset the Sadducees since they didn't believe in the resurrection. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. How be, how be it, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. So it's really untelling how many people got saved that, that day, just for the men was 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Ananias, the high priest, and Caiaphas and John, now this isn't John the disciple, Matter of fact, uh, from John Henry's commentary, it's basically thought that he was a son of Caiaphas or Ananias one. But uh, that's, that's probably just his work. Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priests were gathered together at Jerusalem. When they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, we do this day, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole? Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by
Tuesday, Monday, what was going to be in this message, I knew what the message was going to be. I knew where it was going to be. <coughs> well, I knew in Romans where it was going to be. But if you'd have told me this would have been part of it, it would have been news to me. <coughs> but it was something that come up, thought that this was, this message wasn't what I spoke on at the end of daycare. One of the chapters was this chapter, Matthew chapter 19. And it fits so wonderfully with this. And I'm going to give you a little background. We're going to concentrate on verses 27 through 30, but I'm going to give you a little background of what's happened prior to this. You've had the rich young ruler. And he's approached Jesus and he wants to know what good thing he can do to inherit eternal life. Well, that's a mistake right there. He wants to know what he can do. How, what good work can he do? And that, you know, if a man was to come to me with that question, that's what I would start with. But Jesus being perfect, that's not where he started. Jesus started somewhere else with this man. And he actually starts by saying, because the man referred to him as good master. And Jesus responds to him by saying, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. Now, some people might say, well, that's proof that Jesus himself was claiming not to be God. But in truth, Jesus was very much calling himself God right there. Because what he was telling this young man is, if you're calling me good, know who you're calling. <coughs> because that's the first part of salvation. You know, if I was to ask a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon if they believe in Jesus, they would say they do. But it's not the Jesus of the Bible that they worship or that they believe in. Uh, Mormons, for instance, believe that God the Father was a man who lived on another planet at one time. They believe Jesus is one of God's billions of spirit children, and that he and Lucifer are actually brothers. Well, that's not from the Word of God. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, Mike, that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. They don't believe that Jesus was bodily resurrected. They believe he was spiritually resurrected, but not bodily. So again, we know that they're not saved. They're not part of the church. They, they have bought into a lie. We need to pray for people like that. The first part of coming to salvation is knowing that Jesus is God. Amen. And if you don't get that right, nothing else follows. And that's where Jesus was leading this man. Then Jesus speaks of some of the commandments. And then the young man responds, well, I've, you know, I've kept them from my youth. So the young man actually lied to God's face because none of us has kept the commandments from our youth. We've all broke repeatedly. And this young man had his will. And one of the other gospels is actually says, you know, if it had been me and a man had responded like that, I would have pointed out his flaw. But in one of the other Gospels, it actually says Jesus beheld him and loved him. Jesus loved this man. He was, he was so close. He was so close, and yet at the same time, he was, he was a universe away from where he needed to be. And... He, but he knows, he knows he's missing something. He knows something's missing. And so he asks Jesus what he lacks. And Jesus tells him, go sell all that you have, give to the poor. Now Jesus is not saying that's how you get saved. Because that would be a works-based salvation. Just like with each and every one of us before we were saved, there was at least one area in our life that was a stumbling block. That was a problem to get past. <coughs> Jesus knew what this young man's problem was. He knew what this young man's stumbling block was because it says he had great possessions. And it says he left sorrowful. And then Jesus spoke about, and you know, even most non-believers, can, they can bring up the, it's easier for, it, it, he talked about how it was difficult for a rich man to go to heaven and how it was easier for a camel to travel through the eye, or go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to even enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, he wasn't saying it was impossible. 
We have plenty of examples in God's word of rich men that were godly men. Uh, I'll, I'll name one, Joseph of Arimathea, that claimed Jesus' body after the crucifixion. He was a very wealthy man. But this blows the disciples away. They were of the opinion, they were of the thought when they seen wealthy and rich people, that God had blessed them that. And so surely they were going to be saved. And yet what Jesus is telling them is completely different. So the disciples ask a question, but I want to focus on a second question. And it gets us back, when we focus on this second question, it gets us back to putting on Jesus. And Peter asked the question, verse 27 through 30, and then I'm going to focus back on verse 29. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all. I want you to keep that word in your mind, forsaken, because we're going to say it again. And follow thee. What, what shall we have therefore? Now, a lot of people might think, well, that's a rather odd question. And might even think it's rather cold. How in the world could he be asking the Lord God Jesus, what are you going to give us for following? But Jesus didn't take it as cold or odd. Jesus took it as a serious and important question and he answers it. And he answers it directly for these 12 men minus, minus Judas, who gets replaced by Matthias, Matthias later on. But he answers the question for them, then he answers the question for each and every one of us that has ever accepted God's gift of salvation in verse 29. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, he also shall sit upon, upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So these twelve men, minus Judas, replaced by Matthias, they will judge the twelve tribes of Israel. That's going to be one of the gifts they, they're going to receive. But then Jesus goes on to speak about us. Verse 29. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. Jesus uses that word forsaken as well. And that word forsaken means to turn away from entirely. And the thoughts that come to my mind about that, and that's, that's how we, and there's other, no doubt, ways, but this is one of the ways we put on Jesus. We forsake anybody or anything at any time when it's in opposition or they are in opposition to God. Amen. And I thought about I, I said it last week when Jesus spoke from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, God the Father did just that. He had forsaken his only begotten son at that moment in time. But I also thought about, and, and this doesn't just apply to preachers, this would be with any of us. And, and this come to my mind at the adult daycare as well. But I thought about Romilla. And I also thought about a lady that's there at the adult daycare. Her husband was a pastor. He's, he's passed on. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. But I thought about Romillus. And I thought about her husband. And those 2 o'clock in the morning phone calls they got over the years. And not just the 2 o'clock in the morning phone calls, but the phone calls that could come any time, night or day. How often had Romillus over the years? And this may sound harsh, and I don't mean it that way, and, and, I, and God doesn't mean it that way, but it is, it is difficult. How often did Romillus forsake, I believe? How often did he fors forsake Jeanette, Anita, their son, other family, friends, and loved ones to prepare for a message, to one of those 2 o'clock in the morning phone calls to get up, answer the phone, get dressed, go to his automobile, go wherever he needed to go. 
And that is putting on the Lord Jesus. That's putting on the Lord Jesus. And again, it's not just for preachers. It's for all of us. Because any of us could receive. Now, no doubt for pastors, it's far more likely they get those 2 o'clock in the morning phone calls. But each and every one of us could receive one of them this evening. Somebody could call. Somebody you, maybe you've witnessed to. And they've been resistant. And, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost is working on them. And their first thought is, I got to call James. I've got to talk to Mike. I've got to get in touch with Crystal. Uh, so any of us could be that. And it requires putting on the Lord Jesus. And that brings us to point number three. And if you would, if you'd go back to Romans, where we was in verse thir or in chapter 13 of Romans. And for the most part, that's where we're going to wind up this evening. Uh, or excuse me, chapter 13, verse 14. Who is responsible for putting on the Lord Jesus? Does God put the Lord Jesus on for us? Now, God does conform us into the image more and more into the likeness of His Son, but God doesn't put the Lord Jesus on for us. When you got up this morning, who dressed you? You dressed. Those of us that's here this evening, we're capable of dressing ourselves. I know there are people that can't, and we're blessed. We was blessed this morning that we got up still able to do that for ourselves. Amen. And just like we dressed ourselves physically this morning, it is our responsibility to put on the Lord Jesus every day through every circumstance because it is so important. It's so important that the world, how many times have you heard Dean say, and I'll use me as the example instead of Dean, but you'll, you'll recognize it when you hear it. If you've never met Michael Phillips, you've never missed anything. But if you've, missed G, if you've, if you've never met Jesus, you've missed it all. So it's important that the world see Jesus. Well, how do they see Jesus? They see Him when we're wearing Him. When we're wearing Jesus, they see Jesus. And most of the world hates our guts for that, and you can see it. You can see it in the, in the commentaries. Uh, Donna didn't go in, into any details, uh, I think it was yesterday evening, telling me about something that she had seen that was, and I'll, I'll use my word, I, I, I wish you'd think about putting on the Lord Jesus. I read it as a command. Not Amen. A suggestion. This is a command. You know, you can go to Exodus chapter 20 and you can read the Ten Commandments. And you can read right there the summary of the Ten Commandments. This right here is ever been as much a commandment as those ten up there. It lacks nothing. It is a, well, you've heard Dean say this book is full of commandments. This is one of those. We need to put on the Lord Jesus. The world, God wants us to put on the Lord Jesus. God has commanded us to put on the Lord Jesus, those of us that have been washed in the blood. And the world needs us to. This is a, I don't follow the news so much anymore. I used to be a political news junkie. But Monday, as I was preparing lunch, had the radio on, and that another shooting was mentioned at another nightclub down there. And, that, and I've not heard anything since. I've not. 
but they talked about there was people as young as 13 in that nightclub. 13. There was, and, I, and I'm, I talked about it at the adult daycare son. Where was daddy and mom? But you know, it really goes deeper than that. How many in the church do not take the time to put on the Lord Jesus for these people to see? And therefore, they never see Jesus. They never, and when they hear the gospel, and, you know, they watch movies and TV shows and what have you that, that make fun of Christians. They don't want anything to do with them. We are in desperate need of each and every one of us every day. And it has to be every day. You can't say, well, I put Jesus on today and not think about him tomorrow. It's got to be a daily thing. It's got to be an ongoing. It's a command. Put on the Lord Jesus. And I, I'll sum it up with that. And uh, with that said, uh, I, I am going to mention one other thing, but it's, it's after we, we've wrapped up here. I want to mention one thing briefly. Every one of us here that's of age is saved. So therefore, we're part of the church. And I want us to think about something. And I'll mention that. Uh, but uh, with that, William, would you close us out this evening?